meeting is being recorded. Good morning, everyone. I uh, hope everybody had a good holiday weekend. Uh, it's just kind of weird when you start the week on Tuesday. And I'm, I'm sure everybody spent a lot of time saying like, wait, what, what, what's today? What, what are you doing? So I had to remind myself. But uh, so we have Parshas Chukas. Again, here in Diaspora, it's Chukas. In Israel, they're still a Parsha ahead in Balak. We don't catch up until for uh, quite a bit of time. And the the... Parsha begins with Para Aduma, which we should be familiar with because it's the reading for Parsha's Para. And we have uh, people come then to the wilderness of Zin, the how they the wilderness of Zin. Okay. And then they have this little, little episode called May Mariva, the waters of strife. It's a slightly very important part of the Chumash because this is where the decree is given that Moshe and Aaron cannot go into the land of Israel. And we have that whole episode, a couple of battles, and then we actually have in this parsha the death of Aharon and the death of Miriam. So I will not be discussing May Mariva. If you want to dive into that, that's uh, quite a topic to take on. Uh, the Mefarshim I don't know, if you look through all the classic Mepharshim, I'm not even talking about contemporary, classic Mepharshim, you'll probably come up with, I don't know, 25 to 30 reasons as to what went wrong there. Which just tells you, and we say this all the time, that when Mepharshim gives so many reasons for one thing, that means that nobody knows what they're talking about. I don't, I don't mean that in a crass way, I'm just saying that you know, we're really kind of at a loss as to understand what exactly um, is going on. But I do want to look at the episode of the death of Aharon, uh, because I think it's very important. A lot we can learn, especially about Jewish leadership, uh, which is always this. This is the book. This is the this is the safer that deals with Jewish leadership. Anybody who's looking for a book on Jewish leadership, I would recommend this. Uh, it's called Leadership in the Wilderness by a uh, what's her, this author. Maybe you've heard of her, Erica Brown. Uh, really, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a phenomenal book, but any book that's written about the life and career of Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Rabbi Moshe Lichtenstein wrote a book on it, Rav Tzvi Grummet wrote a book on it, and there's a lot of more sort of scholarly books as well about Moshe and leadership in the wilderness, really, really interesting stuff. So if you have the stone chumash, we're going to turn to 846. If you have a regular chumash, we're going to be in chapter 20. Now, when I get to the sources, I'll, I'll, I'll put it on the, uh, I'll put it on the, on the screen. Uh, we actually only have uh, really, really one source today, but it's, it's worthwhile. So, Now, this, you have to see it in context. This is in context. This is after the battle of uh, Edom and that, that whole thing then you have or, or the episode of May Mariva and by the way we have to mention that somewhere in this Parsha we went to year 40 in the desert so we've discussed that a lot leading up to this Parsha that we have we were in year two and then all of a sudden we're in year 40 um, it's kind of like how the you know I always say in the, in the soap operas it's, it's, it's allowed in, in the halacha of soap operas you're allowed to skip a kid is allowed to be like five years old in one, one episode and the next week the kid could be a teenager or already 20 that's allowed it's a, it's a, it's a halacha psuka in soap operas as you can see I grew up what my mother watched so the, uh, the so now they come from Kadesh and they're in Har 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 Hashem El Moshe El Aharon Har Har El Al Gvul Eretz Adam Lemar Hashem says to Moshe and to Aaron in Har Har in the boundaries of the land of Edom. So now, again, Edom, so they're getting close to Israel already. They're on the precipice of entering. So this is the term that's used always for tzaddikim. Tzaddikim are gathered onto their people. So the words yeh asef. So it says yeh asef. Aaron will be gathered to his people. He's not going to enter the land that I have given to the children of Israel. Why? Because Marisim SP, you have here, it defines it as you have defied my word at the waters of strife. Now, again, we could spend a lot of time trying to figure out what went wrong at May Mariva. And I think the more troubling thing to try and figure out at May Mariva was why is Aaron punished there? Because if you look through the episode, he didn't do anything. 
He didn't say anything. He didn't do anything. He was just there. And God punished Moshe and Aaron. Moshe is the one who hit the rock. Moshe is the one who got the commandment. What, what, Aaron, what he was, just, you know, guilt by association. So this causes a lot of uh, distress amongst the Mepharshim, as it were. And some will even go so far as to say that Aaron really was punished for his role in the Chet Ha'egel. But his role in the golden calf, in which he played a major role, as we have looked at many times, but if you go back to chapter 32, chapter 33 of Shemos, Aharon clearly was involved in the Chet Ha'egel, and he seems to get off kind of scot-free. So maybe there, as we discussed last time, remember, what does it apply to? Is it applied to Egel Maraglim? Maybe that's sort of the stay of execution that he got. And this is what it said. And, and, you know, it's kind of to like make it nice. You know, you ever, you ever, uh, I don't know, a person gets a, a traffic offense. And like the worst thing we're worried about is the points. First of all, nobody likes getting caught. Nobody likes, like, it, it's a horrible feeling. If, if you've been pulled over by, by a policeman, I don't know, like your heart sinks as if like, oh my gosh, like what, what, what? all right, you did something wrong, you got caught. But, but it's still, it's, it's very frightening and you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm terrible, isn't that? And then you have, a, I don't know, you got a moving violation and then, you know, you know you're gonna have to pay it, but the judge says, okay, I won't give you a point. We're gonna, we're gonna chalk it up as a, uh, I don't know, busted taillight, something like that. You know, so you got, plea bargain down to a non-points offense, but you have to pay just the same. So it's almost like that. Uh, so Aaron, yeah, he was punished for the Chet Egel, but we're going to chalk it up to, to this. And where everybody says, wait, wait, Aaron. So, you know, in other words, we don't look so badly upon him or we don't cast him in this negative aspersions uh, if that's the if that's the, the real reason. Well, so that, that's an approach, not the approach, the only approach. It is an approach, which is brought down in the Mepharsh. Okay. So he then tells him, Kachis Aharon, the S Elazar Benov, Ha'al Osam Harhar. So Moshe says, take your brother, take Elazar, his son, and bring them up to Harhar. And Aaron will then take off his priestly garments, the priestly vestments, the big day kahuna, and he will place them on Elazar. And Aaron then will be gathered into his people and he will die there. Mepharshim also point out something interesting that um, first of all, the beauty of this is an immediate succession. And I don't know who wouldn't sign up for this where you're gonna to be told this is when you're gonna die. And the next one who's gonna succeed you is going to be right there. And you're literally gonna give over the mantle of leadership. So whatever the big day kahuna were now, there's something unusual here because if, you're taking off the, the priestly vestments and putting them directly on him, then they'll be on in reverse order, right? Because the outer one would be going on first, but that seems to be what it's indicating. But something miraculous happens, however, that, he's, that they're put on appropriately. But the message is, is that Aharon was able to witness in the very last moment of his life that his son was taking over exactly where he left off. And I don't think, I don't know anybody in the world who wouldn't sign up for that. Um, to know that you're, because that's all we, we wish for for our kids. We want our kids to have our values. We want our kids to have uh, our traditions. We want them to, I don't know, we want them to remember us. <laughs> we want them to, uh, Reb Salvechik always used to tell a story when he was in Brookline that there was a, uh, an old woman that used to come into the shul in Brookline and she wanted to put up a yard site plaque. And he said, who's it for? She said, it's for me. He's like, I don't understand. You know, you're alive and well. He's like, well, I, I just, when I leave this world, I want somebody to remember me. And it's a very sad commentary, but that's the truth is that we want nothing more than to leave our mark on this world to be remembered, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we're very, Jews are very into plaques, right? The state of Israel is really called Plakistan. Um, if you ever, you ever just take a walk through like Yad Vashem, I mean, whoever has a contract for those plaques is Baruch Hashem doing well. Uh, but that's that's what we do. So he tells him, you're going to take him up. So, Vayas Moshe Kasher Tziva Hashem, Vayalu Al Har Har Le'enei Kol Haida. This is a very important line here. Is that Moshe did exactly as Hashem commanded him. And they, all three of them, went up to Har 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 in front of everyone. So everyone knew what's going on or they have an idea or they see something that's going on. Wait a minute, why are the three of them going up there? Moshe then, he removed the garments from Aharon. 
and then he placed them and he dressed them onto Elazar, his son. Vayamas Aaron Sham Beroshahar, and Aaron died there on the head of the mountain. Vayevred Moshe Elazar Min Hahar. So three went up, two came down. The final moment is Vayiru Kol Haida Ki Gova Aaron. The entire assembly, they saw that Aaron has died. Meaning, how do they see this? Well, first of all, three of them, um, three of them went up and two of them came down. So Rashi says, if you're in the stone homage, it's on the, the sixth line of Rashi. When they saw that three of them went up and two only two came down, they said, where is Aaron? Amalehem Mace. They said he died. Amru, so the people didn't believe that Aaron could die. He, he defied all the odds and plagues and everything. So it said Moshe then actually projected somehow, as some miracle occurred, that he projected some sort of image of the Malach Amavis himself, of the angel of death. Or here, really, it's the, the they say the, 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 the Malachi Hashores, the ministering angels, but an, I mean, angel is an angel, whether good or bad. And they, in other words, they had an image in front of them projected that Aaron has actually died. Okay. Vayivku, so they see, everybody sees that Aaron died. Vayivku is Aaron Shloshim Yom, Kol Beis Yisrael. So then Aaron is mourned by the entire congregation for 30 days. Okay. So, first of all, it's a hard job for Moshe to do. First of all, Aaron is his older brother. And you can imagine it's a hard job for Elazar. And to be told, here, you're going to go and you're going to die. And everybody just kind of like calmly walks. And then they come back and the people realize that he's gone. And they mourn, they cry, etc. As a matter of fact, in Sefer Devarim, we are told it's not mentioned here, but it's mentioned in Devarim or maybe end of Bam. No, no, I'm sorry. In, in, in Parshas Masse, Parshas Masse, it's the date of Aaron's death is given. It's the only yard site mentioned in the entire Torah. Anybody know what it is? Extra points if you get this one. You could Google it really fast. Hey, Siri, when is Aaron a coin? Um, um, it's the first day of Av, Rosh Chodesh Av. Rosh Chodesh Av, we're told, and it's the only yard site mentioned in the entire Torah. Now, we know, for instance, when Moshe Rabbeinu died, we know when Miriam died. Miriam died on the uh, the 10th of Nisan, we're told, which um, is actually then, um, we had it, yeah, we had that, that's before here. It's it's earlier, It's that's that's what caused the whole Mamer because when she died, the water stopped. And then this is later on, uh, the Rosh Chodesh Av. Moshe, we know, has died on Zayin Adar. But again, the Gemara goes through lots of calculations to figure that out, kind of this way, that way. Oh, then we can figure out 30 days, three, ten, ten, ten. that's how we know. And based on Pesukim and Yehoshua, that's how we know that Moshe Rabbeinu died on Zayin Adar. But the actual date that is given never says, Vayam Hashem Moshe on the Zayin Adar. It doesn't say that Miriam died on Yudis. Those are all figured out. But Aaron, it says, that in the first day of the month of Av, it tells us exactly when he died. So that's something worth looking into, um, a little bit of a summer investigation. Why is his, of all people, why is his yard site mentioned? Okay, so there we have the death of Aharon. Pretty straightforward. It's actually a very nice thing. As a matter of fact, when um, in Parshas Pinchas, when Moshe looks for succession, um, Moshe, let's actually, it's worth it's worth looking at the uh, at this pasuk. If you're on the stone, page eight eighty eight. It's in in the regular chumash. It's Perak Chav Zion, chapter twenty seven, verse twelve. Chav Zion Yud Beis in the chumash in Devar in in Bamidbar. So in eight eighty eight. Now, by the way, Pentecost, we're getting to the end of Bamidbar, which means it's the end of the Chumash, because Devarim is just Moshe Rabbeinu's speech. So he's, and he, Moshe's already told that he's not going to go into the land. So he says, go to the mountain of Avarim, and you're going to see the land that I've given to the children of Israel. You're going to see it. You're going to be, you're going to be gathered unto your people. You're going to die also. 
just like Aaron, your brother was. Why? And here again, it's almost like a, it seems like a little bit of a stuff. Like it, it didn't seem like if you were writing this, I'm not so sure it's necessary here or certainly by Aaron to mention, oh, because of what you did. Uh, so we have to look into that. But Kashem Risen Pib and Midbar Tsin Bim Rivas Aidalak Yushin Bamaim Lane Ahem, Hey Mim Rivas Kadash Midbar Tsin. Because you rebelled against my word in the wilderness of sin, et cetera, et cetera, the water, that's why you're not going up. So it's important to see it in the context that because Moshe is told, you will die, Kasher Nesaf Aharon Achicha, just like Aharon died. So wait a minute, what does that mean, just like Aharon died? So you could take it in its sort of physical, literal sense that he didn't suffer, he didn't have pain, you know, he lied, he, he was lying down on the rock and God kissed him, and they call that Misas Nishika, which Rashi brings. He says he died Misas Nishika, and if everybody's ever experienced that, um, where you have a, a loved one and they don't suffer and they're just kind of there, and then one second they're there and the next second they're not there, uh, we call that the uh, the Misas Nishika, the, you know, not 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 the kiss of death, but it's death by a kiss. Uh, we could make a whole new spin on that because we want to make it very, very positive. And if someone merits that, it's considered a great, a great tzuchus, if you could have the misas nishika. So the, the, however, if we take it a step further, that Aaron died knowing that he had succession. He died knowing that his son put on his garments and just continued in his footsteps. So that explains the very, very next pasuk here. Again, it's Pasuk Tezvav, you're in 2715, it's page 888. So then, then Moshe speaks to Hashem and he says, Hashem Now he asks for a successor. In other words, he has the clue that God said, oh, you can have, um, you can have a death like Aaron's. So he said, wait a minute, Aaron, his sons took over. So some of the Farshim actually even suggest that Moshe wanted his own sons to take over. In a moment of sort of uh, human, human nature, let's put it, because most people don't even know the names of Moshe's sons. Moshe's sons are not mentioned in any, other than when they're named or in reference, but they, they didn't do anything. Uh, they, they certainly didn't do anything great because they were... Uh, uh, later on, we find out that some of the descendants were less than less, less than awesome. Um, so if that's the case, Moshe is even suggesting, like, like instead of just being this sort of machine leader that kind of just does, 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 he has a moment where he's like a father and he's like, oh, maybe I want my son to take over. OK, so then he goes into he says, I need someone that we, we, we express the qualifications. Fine. Um, part of another topic, which you looked at in the past, maybe we'll look at it again in a few weeks. But. Um, if you notice what's, what's, this is to me the most fascinating Pasuk, one of the most fascinating Pasukim in the entire Torah is Pasuk Tezvav because it looks so innocuous. But when you read it carefully, it kind of smacks you in the face because it says, Vaidaber Moshe El Hashem Lemor. It's always Vaidaber Hashem El Moshe Lemor. Vaidaber is a strong language. God speaks to Moshe saying, God speaks to Aaron. God's, here it's Moshe speaks to God. Vaidaber Moshe, Vaidaber Moshe. Moshe speaks, but speaks to God Lemor saying. Interesting. So it's like Moshe's taking control. He's giving the instructions and God has to listen. Okay, but that's, that's part of it. But you have to see that in context. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is the very, very end of the Torah. The very, very end of the Torah, which we're going to get to soon enough. Um, we're less than three months away from Rosh Hashanah right now. So we have to start repenting. And 1122. 11.22, and um, page, it's like 11, chapter 34 in Devarim. Lamed Dalid, and let's start with Pasuk Dalid on the top. Very, very sad. You know my whole, my whole shtick on this, of course, is that the last part, why do we read this? This is, to me, is the saddest part of the Torah. The death of Moshe Rabbeinu, and after everything that he did, and recounting all of his accomplishments, and we read it on, don't read it on a Shabbos, we read it on Simplest Torah. The day when everybody's acting like a Meshuggah, da, 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 da. I think that's a cover-up. It's a great cover-up of history is that, you know what, people just couldn't tolerate reading this on a regular Shabbos. It'd be too sad. So we do it on Simplest Torah. And that's part of the advent of Simplest Torah, but a conversation for another time. Okay, so Pasuk Dalit. Vayomer Hashem elav, zos ha'aretz asher nishbati la'av, ar homli tzok li'akov le'imor, lazar echla etinena, herisi chaveinecha v'shem alos ha'avor, 
he's telling him, you can look out at the land. This is the land which I swore to Avraham, to Yitzchak, to Yaakov. I will give it to your offspring. Look, I let you see with your own eyes, but you know what? You're not going there. And it just, it hurts. It hurts to read these verses. In this week's Parsha, it hurts to hear that he can't go into the land of Israel after everything. It hurts when, you know, and on Parsha's Veschanan, and he's trying to, he's trying to, uh, to daven one last chance. Can I get into the land of Israel? I mentioned a number of years ago, I, I had the, I, I always go away right after Tisha B'av, which is always Veschanan. So that, that year, Parsha's Veschanan, we spent Shabbos in Mitzpah Yericho. Mitzpah Yericho is on the way down to the Jordan Valley on the way down to, let's say, if you're going towards uh, En Gedi Masada, one of the communities there, and beautiful, the desert, and you look outside, and all you see in the mountains is you see Jordan, but you see Ammon and Moab. And I remember thinking, like, this is the part where Moshe's begging to go to Eretz Yisrael, and I'm here. All he wanted to do was to be right here, and he's right over there. And he just wanted to be right here, and I'm like, I didn't, and I'm able to get to Israel. I don't even have to speak to a human being. I just have to hit a few buttons somewhere, and then all of a sudden, I can get on a plane, I'm in Israel. And Moshe Rabbeinu, all he wanted to do, he said, let me go in as a citizen. I'll go in as, I'll do whatever you want. I don't, I don't have to be the leader. But he was denied. And it's mentioned again at the very end of his life. So, Moshe there died in the land of Moab. And look at the description, a two-word description given to Moshe Rabbeinu. It doesn't say that he's the greatest leader of all time. It doesn't say that. Da, da. He's described as Eved Hashem. Right? Who wouldn't sign up for that either, right? Eved Hashem. He's buried. Of course, we don't know where he's buried. And Moshe is 120 years old. By the way, he was still in pretty good shape. You know, he didn't lose a step. And then here, the puzzle. Here, the Bnei Yisrael, they cried for him 30 days. And then the days of crying for Moshe are over. So, if you have... Um, if you still have Parshas Chukas open, or if you want to flip back to 848, okay, 848, if you look at Pasuk Chavtes, you compare the Pasuk, or let's say, let's compare the reaction of B'nai Yisrael when Aaron died versus the reaction when Moshe died. It seems the same, right? Right, so I'll read it to you again. Here at Moshe, it says, They cried for him 30 days. And for Aaron, it says, Then they, 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 they also cried 30 days. Same or different? Different. Call B'nai Israel. Oh, you see, you didn't fall for the, you didn't take the bait, Gail. Very good. You were an observant Jewess. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I purposely phrased it in a deceiving fashion. That's what we do. Um, yes, Kol Beis Yisrael. It says for Aaron that everyone mourned him. But for Moshe, not everyone did. So before we look at, we're going to look at one of them at Farshim and then maybe express another idea. Any ideas why? Any thoughts why? Aaron had the ability to get forgiveness for B'nai Yisrael and his role. And Moshe was always the one kind of disciplining them. So he was the more kind of the leader that was taking the complaints and just the, the relationship was more negative in terms of the daily contact than it would have been with Aharon, which Aharon gives them absolution or I'm not, that's not the right word, but allows them to achieve forgiveness. So it seems like a more positive. Um, and my second thought was that Aharon suffered loss and they, everyone from B'nai Israel suffered loss because everyone, so many people died in the, in the Midbar, that maybe there was a natural connectivity because of a shared experience. I like that. I like that. I'm not sure anybody says that. We'll see. Um, but you, so the, the first answer is the good cop, bad cop answer. That's what is it? I'll, I'll call it that. Is that fair? Very. Uh, okay. Uh, plus, we know that the, the, the Mishnah, in Perkeavos describes it says a person should be like the students of Aaron a Cohen is what? Ohev Shalom and Rodev Shalom. So Aaron was sort of with the people. In other words, how often do you have it where where and again it's an American thing in Israel, it's a very, very different. It's an American thing when somebody dies and you hear about it and you know who it is, you have to go through a whole calculation of like, 
should I go or should I not go? Like, I didn't really know them. I didn't really have anything to do with them. I'll send a note or I'll make a donation or, uh, I mean, they, they're not going to miss me. You know, like we have all these types of cheshbonas that go. So, but then as a person says, no, no, of course, you, like, of course we're going to go. Like, it's not even, it's not even a question. Um, so Aaron had this personal connection with many, many people, but that's because he was in the trenches, always, always Shalom, Rodeo Shalom. He was known as the first marriage counselor. He would try to settle disputes between different parties, uh, all types of disputes. And he was a man of the people. So being a man of the people, <coughs> which warrants then everybody felt affected by him. So therefore they felt personally affected by his law. So therefore they reacted or responded in appropriate morning fashion, which is Bechia, which is crying. Moshe, Moshe is kind of this lofty, lofty person. And you know what? He's the leader. Yeah, like he has control over me or something. But at the same time, yeah, okay, you know, maybe he was mean to me or maybe I don't get him or maybe, I don't, you know, however you want to look at that. Um, we can't always relate to every leader. Uh, we don't necessarily feel that connection. So that's a, that's a very intuitive and smart answer. But I like what you said about the shared experiences. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look now at the Orachayim HaKadosh. The Orachayim HaKadosh has in his commentary um, on Parshas, um, on this Pasuk in, in, in Devarim. All right, everybody see it? Thumbs up, you see it on the screen? Okay, good. So this is the Arachaim. Arachaim gives five reasons, um, five reasons why um, we should look at this differently. So, Vayivku b'nei Yisrael, uva'aharon amar kol b'nei Yisrael. So, Rabbi Sein Ozal, Avust Rabbi Nason, Nos Nutam, Lefi Shehaya Ohiv Shalom. So that's the first one that I mentioned. That's the obvious answer, is that um, the Mishnah and the Mishnah of Rabbi Nason says that since Aaron was always one who was pursuing peace and he was very involved with the people. That's why people felt affected by him and from his loss. Everyone, as opposed to Moshe. Okay, that's the first reason. The next one, Rabbi Avraham ben Ezra, he quotes the Eben Ezra, Kasav, Shabachu kol beis Yisrael l'chvod Moshe shahayachai. Here he says that the reason why everybody cried is in deference, that's a totally different take on it, in deference to Moshe Rabbeinu, who was still living. So in other words, it wouldn't look good if Moshe Rabbeinu, the leader of the people, lost his brother and he and people are just, you know, kind of not showing up. He says, it's an interesting take on it. That's the Evan Ezra's take. He says, <laughs> He says, but don't, I, you can't believe what he says. It's very strong words also. And these, these are the way the Mepharshim, they write about one another. It's done in, with, with respect, but it's very, very honestly, intellectual honesty. He says, I don't, I don't believe a word he says. He says, don't tell me that they're faking it, that they really wouldn't have given Aaron their full attention as they did with Moshe, not give their full attention and only in deference to him. He says, don't take away from the goodness. No, they did something good, meaning they mourned, they, they truly mourned Aaron. And the question is not why they mourned Aaron to everyone, but why didn't they all mourn Moshe Rabbeinu? So he says, don't take away from that by saying, oh, in honor and deference to Moshe Rabbeinu, that's why they did it. But it's an answer. He brings it, but he disputes it and he discounts it. That's number two. Three, the Ulai. He says, maybe also when it came to Aaron, as we just saw in the Psukim, they just saw him going up to the mountain. They didn't know that he died. They didn't see him get struck by lightning. They didn't see him get swallowed up in the earth. They didn't see him, you know, collapse, whatever. They just learned suddenly that he died. They came down. They said, what happened? They said, oh, he died. He says, he says, when you hear the shock of something, the shock of something is much more of a jolt to your system and it causes more bechi, causes more crying. Moshe gave two months and change of preparation for the people saying, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm not going into the land. By the way, this is what you have to do because I'm going to die. I'm going to die. So they were prepared mentally for that and emotionally for that. 
unlike with our own, with our own, they didn't have that. It, it came as a shock to them. And I'm sure that we've all been in situations, Lo'aleinu, where we've had a, a, a shock, a death that's a shock to us. And it just, it, it stirs the emotions far, far differently. Um, that doesn't mean that when you're prepared for it, that it's any less. Again, again it depends on your, I'm talking about, let's say someone who, um, who's maybe not immediately close to you and you hear the shock of it, it's, 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 it jolts your system much more than if you had been prepared for it. If someone who's close to you, you could be as prepared as anything and it doesn't take away the, the crying, the pain, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, that's, so, but here he's just making the contradistinction between Moshe and Aaron. Aaron, they didn't prepare for it. They weren't ready for it. And it came as a shock. And therefore they all cried. And Moshe, they were all ready for it. That's three. Four. Od Efshar, Kimisas Aaron here to Gisha Sambiosa. He says it's possible that maybe they felt the death of Aaron more acutely. What's the word I'll use? Lefisha, take off the stalko anane hakova behusar masuchasam. He says, maybe the effect of Aaron's death was far more acute and immediate than the effect of Moshe Rabbeinu's death. Aaron, as soon as he died, the clouds of glory left them. And when the clouds of glory left them, then they were subject to attack from other nations. So they realized that their force field was down, so to speak. And it affected every single person in the community. And therefore they cried. Moshe, he died and maybe there were effects, but the truth is he says they were so close to going into the land of Israel. And he says they were so excited about Biasa Aretz that they didn't cry in the same way. It's an interesting approach as well. But by the way, in the death of Miriam, we see also the immediate effect is that the well stopped and then right after that, the, the waters of strife happened. And that was directly as a result because of Misas Miriam. That's number four. Od Efshar, Sheba Misas, and here's the fifth reason he gives, Sheba Misas Moshe Tekef Ra'u Dover Chadash. He says, when Moshe died, they saw something new right away. Sheshar Sashchina al Yehoshua v'lakchu nechama. That the Shechina, the divine presence, automatically transferred to Yehoshua, who was the second in charge, and he assumes the helm. Again, we just saw in Parshas Pinchas that Moshe Rabbeinu Davin for this. He wanted it. And Hashem said, Yehoshua is going to take over. So once they saw that there was no, um, there was no moment in which there was a cessation of leadership, it, the, the flow was seamless. The transfer was seamless. And as soon as Moshe died, the Shechina, and because it was, it was, it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a visual thing where people had the sense they understood that the Shekhinah was surrounding uh, Yehoshua, which means, oh, okay, he's taking over. And as soon as they saw that, because they have relied so heavily on Moshe all these years, and they were about to go into the land of Israel, but now that they see that Yehoshua has it, fine. And he gives a mashal. Mashal, what's the parable? So what can this be compared? A person loses a precious stone. And then you find another one in its place, equally as precious. He says, even though it's not the same one, but at least you'll find some modicum of comfort and saying, at least I have something. And therefore they did not all, every single person cry. Because it says they cried and the next verse says, and Yehoshua ben Nun takes over. However, when Aaron Cohen died, of Dumar Golios, the stone was lost and there was no replacement. They didn't have with what to comfort themselves. Ah, you'll ask the question, what about Elazar? Which says that Elazar came down. And even though Elazar is wearing the begadim and he's now the high priest, he says, but they're not crying. They're, they, they're, they're, the people, honestly, if they didn't have a coin Gadol, they wouldn't care as much. Okay, whatever. We have all the Kohan and whatever. They weren't crying about the lack. That they, they weren't worried about, oh my God, we lost our coin Gadol. But they were worried about 
the persona, it's, it's very similar to the first answer. They're very worried about losing the persona of Aaron Cohen, the saintliness. And I think go back to what Gail said at the very beginning, that he was able to achieve absolution. We can use a very, very Jewish term for that. Um, I absolve you of your guilt, just do a couple of Hail Marys or whatever it is, however it works in Judaism. Um, but he said, I, it, he's the person that they had that connection with. And he says, Shaloy Hoyolahem Tumuraso. And there was no Tumura is an exchange. It's a, there, there was no replacement. There's no one that could possibly fill his shoes. So here we have five answers. So just to repeat is that it was, first of all, the character of Aaron because he was Ohiv Sholom, or maybe in deference to Moshe, according to the Eben Ezra, that they, 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 all the people mourn because they, Moshe was still alive in deference to the leader, or which he didn't like that, or maybe because they didn't have any preparation. It was so sudden. It was a shock. Fourth answer is that maybe they felt it because with the, with the cloud gone and they lost their protection right away, so it affected everyone, so everyone cried, unlike with Moshe Rabbeinu. And the last one is that um, they saw, and, and this kind of takes the, the first ones and flips it on their head, on the, the, the psukim, whereas we look at the succession of Aaron as a beautiful thing, here it says actually when Moshe died, there was no cessation and succession whatsoever, even for a moment, went straight directly to Yehoshua, so they felt comforted by that, so not everybody was affected in the sense of panic, crying, shock, or being upset or worried, whereas with Aaron, the person of Aaron was gone, they felt that there was no replacement, so there you go, so there's the, um, there you have in a nutshell, the, um, the position of the Arachayim HaKadosh, but I want to add one more thing, I think there's one more thing that makes a lot of sense when it comes to um, leadership. And, and this is always a question in Jewish leadership as to sort of the merits of, of attaining leadership. And um, we actually, we were discussing this on Friday, this past Friday night in Shul, where we were discussing the, the, the machlokas that Korach has with Moshe Rabbeinu. And Rashi says, like, why did Korach, he was so smart. He was smart. He wasn't a dope. But why did he see to get himself involved in this whole mess? So Rashi gives a whole explanation that he thought that he had righteous descendants, Shmuel Hanavi, and therefore that would, that would save him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, fine. Um, but the truth is, is that in, in a machlokas, when you start trouble with somebody, and even if he would have won, he would be what's called a baldover. And if he's a baldover, he's one of the uh, claimants in the case. It's not like, he could have gotten the job. First of all, he wasn't after Moshe Rabbeinu's job. Nobody's after that job. Nobody wants that job. He wanted Aaron's job. So even if he would have won, if he would have, if he would have won, he would have been in Ogea Badover, a Baldover. There's no way he could have been in that case anyway. So that's what Rashi says. Maro, like what did he even, like what is he trying to get out of it? So some people like to fight for the sake of fighting. That's a very, uh, I, I would say it's a Jewish thing, but it's not a Jewish thing. It's an everybody thing. People just like to, uh, to fight and sometimes they forget what they're even fighting about. They just kind of like fighting. Okay, fine. Now, the question then is, his question, his, his gripe against Aaron Cohen was one of nepotism. If we're going to follow the family line, my family line comes before Aaron's or Moshe, you're taking too much for your own family, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what I mentioned is, is that's one of the reasons why in many synagogues, uh, they could be for generations, it does happen sometimes, but in a lot of synagogues, when let's say a rabbi is retiring, that choosing the son of the rabbi to be the rabbi is not an automatic. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's not even considered. And it's very simple why, it's a simple understanding is that because, um, and, and, I, and I used a very personal example um, because you know, that's the only kind I know how to use, which by the way, I should mention that, I should mention, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that today is Rabbi uh, Kripka's Yartzai. Uh, rabbi Kripka, the founding rabbi of our shul is his uh, Yartzai, Hashem Shav and Aliyah. We should dedicate our learning in the Lili Nishmasa, Shlomo Ben, uh, ben uh, Menashe. Uh, I think it's Shlomo Yitzchak by Menashe. And um, I say, could you just imagine if, let's say, I don't know, 20 years from now, this is what I said, in 20 years from now, okay? I don't, I, I'm just using a number. To not, I don't mean anything about it. I'm just using a number. Let's say 20 years from now, and I'll be 50, that, um, that I'm going to retire, and I'm going to say, you know what? My son should take over. And people are like, are you joking? Like, this kid who we watched him figure out how to jump off the third step of the bima and how to like assault every single member of the congregation, ask them for candy or ask them to take him to the ranger game or whatever, you name it. This little, this little picture, you're going to say that he's going to take, he's going to be our rabbi. So it's, it's a hard thing when you know somebody from their youth, from their, when they were little kids 
and you're going to say, oh, you're going to be the rabbi. So that's one thing. But there are other occasions when leadership, nepotism is warranted. So a leadership position which one merits based on lineage has a far different import and certainly a far different effect than one which is earned by merit. Okay? So Aaron, Aaron was appointed to the job by Moshe. And God said that you, and then we learned that later on, and you and your children and your grandchildren and your grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, they are the Kohanim and they're the ones who are always going to be in the service of the Beis HaMikdash. Okay? Versus Moshe. Moshe, there was no family business there. Moshe was appointed for his qualities because of his qualifications. The next in line was Yoshua. Even though Moshe maybe wanted one of his own family members, it didn't happen. He said, oh, Yoshua is going to take over because of his qualifications. When someone is appointed based on qualifications, people may or may not accept that. And if something goes wrong, all of a sudden, or they see that maybe there's a qualification that's lacking or a quality or something that's lacking because, you know, nobody's perfect, right? Trust me, we deal with this all the time. But if that happens, then people can all of a sudden say, write them off and say, yeah, not my leader, not for me. Whereas if someone was appointed just because, like, in other words, nobody ever complains. By the way, people always complain. Nobody ever complains and you know you have Yisrael and Shul and says, you know, I wanted the first Aliyah. The Kohen gets the first Aliyah. And it could be the same guy every single week. The Shul is one Kohen. It could be the same Kohen. No one ever complains and says, I want to go first. Because they realize that's his birthright. That's the heritage of which he is a part of the family of Kohen or a Levi. And nobody ever says it. But if let's say there's an Aliyah that's a very hush of Aliyah. I don't know. Uh, Pick an Aliyah, the Shira, a service of Dibris, whatever it is. And the guy, I want it. Why should he get it? Why does this guy get it every single year? What did he do to deserve it? He's not so great. So in other words, the people view leadership that is given by a position that is earned versus a position that is inherited, they will inherently look at that very, very different lenses. So therefore, with Aaron or Cohen, people are going to have less problems with Aaron in general because he was born into it. And the rest of his family is born into it. Kacha, that's how it is. So therefore, they're going to have less issues with him. They're not going to get too worked up about anything that happens with the Kohanim. And if that's the case, therefore, he had more of this connection. It affected everybody. All of B'nai Yisrael cried for him. Unlike Moshe Rabbeinu, Moshe Rabbeinu, look, he's gone through a lot. We just looked at the last few parshas alone, what's been happening. Moshe Rabbeinu, because this is a position that was earned and a position which the next person has to earn. So people will find more reason. It's just human nature to find their issues, to find their problems with. And they have to just figure out how, to, how do they manage. And by the way, this happens. We never have the perfect leaders. It's just not possible. It's not, it's, 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 it is physically and it is you know, kind of like a mentally impossible to have a perfect leader. You know, they joke about the rabbi, that the, the perfect candidate for the rabbi has to be 30 years old, have 25 years of experience, ba, 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 he has to be an expert in everything. It's just not realistic, okay? And what's perfect for you is not perfect for the next person. That's, and that's part of, and look at Moshe Rabbeinu, that part of the, part of the explanation, of why, why couldn't he go into the land of Israel? He couldn't, he didn't know how to raise this generation. The generation of slaves that took him out, that, that he knew. Why did he hit the rock? He knew hitting. He hit the rock the first time. Maybe he thinks that's the language you speak, you know? In the last generation, you could smack a kid. Today, you can't smack a kid. Oh, my God. Could you imagine if you smack a kid today? Oh, you right? Lawsuits, newspapers, websites, oh, yeah, yeah, right? Um, you know, we have to issue apologies. You get canceled, all these types of things. So as people change, generations change, the leaders have to either adapt or they have to recognize that they can't lead those generations. But that's leadership that is merit-based. And therefore, there's a very big distinction between the leadership of Moshe Rabbeinu and the leadership of Aaron. And I'll just share with you one last example of this, which we had touched upon years and years ago. And the Gemara, the Gemara in Megillah points this out also, so you can see where I'm going with this, is that at the very end of Megillah's Esther, when it talks about how um, Mordechai, uh, rises up in the echelons of uh, Persian leadership, the very last Pasuk of the Megillah says, I'll read it to you, Ki Mordechai HaYehudi, one we read out loud, Mishneh L'Melech HaShverosh, V'Gadol Elim Ratzid L'Rov Echov, Darish Tov L'Mov, V'Darish Tov L'Mov, V'Darish Tov L'Mov, V'Darish Tov L'Mov, V'Darish Tov L'Mov, V'
Mordechai was a viceroy at Ahasuerus. He was a great man among the Jews and found favor with Rov Echav, a majority, or here it says a multitude, a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them. He sought the good of his people, was concerned for the welfare of all his posterity. The Gemara points out, why does it say Rov Echav, not Kol Echav? Because he went into politics. When you go into politics, you're gonna you're gonna inevitably upset somebody, or you're gonna you're gonna be a thorn in somebody's side. So again, these are lessons of Jewish leadership. So why as whereas a lot of the partial and a lot of the conversation in this partial will focus on what went wrong with the sin of the rock, etc. We cannot let it be lost on us that we lose two greats in this partial. We lose Aaron and we lose Miriam, both in the same partial. <laughs> And uh, we have to examine not only the loss, but the impact that the loss has on the people at large. And it's very different for Aaron than it is for Moshe Rabbeinu, that are Chaim, and also important lessons of Jewish leadership. So uh, again, I hope we'll, uh, everybody, say, thanks for uh, bearing with me going on, on Zoom today. I hope everybody's doing great. Have a uh, wonderful day, wonderful week. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Shortly. you. Just don't forget, today's Tuesday. It's the beginning Thank of the week. Thank you. Yeah. You too. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>